I fall over a lot. My coordination is all over the place. I'm smart, but people around me think I'm dumb because I fall over. My immune system suffers. My nervous system is shot. People around the world struggle every day with dyspraxia. I'm one of those people, and on today's episode of the Mind, Body and Soul podcast, I'm joined by one of my best friends and dyspraxia sufferer, Graham Holm. Today's show is going to be very similar to the work that we do in a teen life coaching session as Graham and I are going to be chatting all things dyspraxia and providing helpful insights and step-by-step coping mechanisms. All that and so much more on today's episode of the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. Welcome to the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. Inspiring, motivating and educating you in finding balance in the craziness of day-to-day life. Learn from and listen to a man who has a wealth of life experience, from business to bodybuilding, artist to author, and has learned to deal with his own physical and mental wellness. But that's not all. Each week, John interviews and picks the minds of special guests from all around the world and from all walks of life, from actors to authors, wrestlers to warriors, business owners to life coaches, and so much more. Welcome to today's episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. I'm excited. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, welcome to another exciting episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast. I am your host, as always, John Morris, and welcome to the show that helps you find balance in the craziness of day-to-day life through inspirational, educational, and motivational content. Today, we are focusing not only on the mind, but also on the body as well as we explore the condition of dyspraxia. And my guest today, I am so thrilled and delighted to have him on because he's he's a fellow Englishman, first of all. He is someone that I have studied with and we've literally gone through so much together. He's also one of my best friends. He's the wonderful Graham Holland. Graham, welcome to the show, my friend. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you for inviting me on. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on uh, and, and to do the show with you. Graham, tell us a little bit about yourself and and just what a normal day looks like for you at the moment. <laughs> a normal day. <laughs> Can you call it that? Um, right. As John already said, I'm an uh, Englishman, um, originally from Southampton. Um, lovely area. New Forest, brilliant. Um, I'm quite old. I'm a little bit older than John. I won't say my age, but I'm a little <laughs> bit older than John. Um, and basically, I do something that's different, probably from very young as a kid. Um, and what I'll say is I grew up sort of, I turned five in the eighties, in the mid eighties. So um, my parents noticed different things about me. They sort of kept on pressing on different things, but school and everything just kept on dissing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just kept on going through all the way through school really, even in secondary school. I hate secondary school. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, I really started noticing a lot of stuff. And as I got older, I noticed that I was very clumsy. Yeah, okay. um, I still yeah, trip up over things, um, smack into things, uh, can't judge necessarily things properly. Um, also holding like hammer and things like that or writing. Um, I write with my left hand. Mm-hmm. And if I write for prolonged periods, my hand starts to ache. Um, also, uh, just trying to think, this is the dyspraxia for it. Uh, <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> um, uh, you know, things like that um, I struggle with. Um, hammering, you know, anything like to do with tools, I look cack handed to okay. put it bluntly. Um, and it drives people mad when they watch me do things. <laughs> they think you could be doing it so much easier. <laughs> what, what was early life like for you, as I say, growing up, wh- when was it that you really started to notice that, or, or even that your parents noticed that, hey, there's something not quite right here? I think it was when, uh, shortly after, but, yeah, like sort of primary school, uh, sort of, I was slower to pick up on reading and writing, okay. um, kind of struggled with that a lot. Um, also, kids at school would laugh at me because I didn't used to run properly, apparently. Right. And um, there was a girl in my primary school who taught me how to run properly. 
because I used to walk with or run with like really gangly legs. Okay. Um, also, I walk, I still walk funny actually as well. Um, I walk like a penguin. Okay. Um, if people notice, they'll probably think, oh, he's walking a bit funny. <laughs> um, and my parents really start to notice things like that. Um, also, I just trip up quite easily as well. Um, and it's it's little things like that. They noticed a few quirks. Okay. Um, and they just couldn't understand it all. Um, yeah, I think I did have an educational psychologist at one point. Mm. I don't think anything really ever came out of that. Right. Um, but then again, that was the 80s. Yeah, well, 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 that's the thing. I mean, because now, uh, because for, for both, you know, for, for Graham and I, we are both dyspraxia sufferers. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what dyspraxia is so people actually uh, notice. And um, basically, I've, I've got some notes written off to the side in case you wonder where I'm looking. Um, dyspraxia is a complex motor neuron condition, okay? It's not just something that you can say, oh, well, this is what causes it, or that's what causes it, or here's a pill that can do this. It is a really complex thing. Um, the best way I can describe it is if you can imagine an old fashioned switchboard. Now, if, kids, if you're watching this, you know, years from now, go and Google what an old fashioned switchboard is. Years ago, before the invention of telephones, you used to have, or before the invention of mobile phones, you used to call up uh, an operator and basically they would be sitting in front of a giant switchboard and basically they would pull cords out and plug them into the relevant places where you want to call. Now, uh, that's just for one thing. Now, imagine that there was 50 million cords and wires and things that you got to do. Now, that's kind of like what a dyspraxic brain is. It's basically like someone in, in, in dealing with the operating side of things took out all the wires, jumbled them all up, and then jammed them back into your brain because our brains are just pulsing off all the time, all these different neurons and all these different thoughts. Uh, that's literally what it is like for a dyspraxia sufferer. Um, Graham has talked about when he started to notice that things weren't quite right, you know, uh, at what point for you, Graham, just, just before we move on, did your parents start to say, maybe we need to get it tested out? Cause obviously the eighties was very different. Dyspraxia wasn't something that was widely known. I think it's actually only now, probably in the last five or 10 years that research is really starting to go into it a lot more and people are starting to understand it a lot more. What, what was that kind of looking like for you when you, you folks took you to the doctors, um, if, if they did, uh, and said, hmm, there's something not quite right here? The doctors just palmed it off, I think, at the time. And, you know, there wasn't enough kind of research. Okay. They knew I had problems, but they couldn't work it. Yeah, they didn't really want to know about it. Um, and from what I've understood from what my parents have told me about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just left to try and work out coping mechanisms or ways around things that I can do necessarily easily. Right. Okay. And that's, you know, I mean, for a lot of people, that's what it ends up being. Um, you know, just so people understand a little bit more, because um, we've got to literally break in this down as, as we go along. Uh, a guy called Dr. Sheldon Horowitz is a guy in the United States. He specializes in dyspraxia and dyslexia and all the other things that go along with it. He calls it this, it's, it's, it is, like I say, a complex uh, motor neuron disorder um, that affects things such as your handwriting, which Graham has spoke about, um, balance, dressing, rhythm, which is one of the things I struggle with, um, bumping. Now, we call this body awareness, so like Graham was saying, you know, sometimes you can walk into things and you're like, how the heck did I manage to do that? Tripping, tripping over nothing, which I know, you know, Graham, that was something that we've spoken about before. Mm -hmm. um, we've both had that once or twice. Your strength, sometimes you can hold on to things too tightly, sometimes too loosely. Um, it can affect your speech, so like your volume control and the, the rate and speed in which you are speaking. Also the articulation. So sometimes people will speak to you and you're like, uh, I didn't have a clue what they just said. And that's sometimes with dyspraxia. Other things that it can affect is your memory and your focus, your planning and completing tasks. Um, and, you know, Graham is going through this now, so we, we are going to unpack Graham's story a little bit more, but I want to put it into context for you, um, for what dyspraxia is. Uh, we're, we're going to go into context now as to, you know, kind of what it was like now for a teenager for you to be suffering dyspraxia, particularly in the 80s and, and in the 90s, because, like you say, you know, school is, it, it can be a horrific place for anybody, um let alone if you've got dyspraxia what what was that like for you um well as you know john i'm not very tall i'm, only, <laughs> I'm not very tall at all so 
you know, and I was very skinny. Right. I don't look at now. Um, <laughs> but back in, you know, the late eighties, early nineties, I was very skinny, very underweight. Right. Um, so for people at school, I was an easy target. Um, yeah, so anything I'd done a bit differently or anything a bit weird, they just clicked on it and honed in on it. And as you as you're probably well aware, of course. And how did that affect you from a from an emotional standpoint? Because you know, for dyspraxia sufferers, you know, we do process things very very differently. Um, anxiety is, you know, one of the things we'll put up a graphic actually, so people can see all the different things that anxiety is, uh, or that, that dyspraxia actually links into anxiety being one of them. What was that kind of like for you knowing, you know, Hey, I've got dyspraxia, um, you know, kids around that time in particular, weren't, you know, really accepting of all changes or anything that was deemed to be weird. Um, what was that like? What was it like? Uh, hard going to be honest um you know i felt different uh you know and because i was picked on quite a bit you know my self-esteem went down quite a bit and that's quite common with yeah. um, dyspraxia sufferers yeah. and other people with similar conditions um suffer from uh self-esteem levels mm -hmm. i still struggle with that right. um sometimes i can get really like like a, it's probably on the verge of depression mm -hmm. where i'll get very low and you know like what a lot of people say you know we, you can hide it well yeah but deep inside you can be a mess oh yeah yeah and and it's and it's terrible and as a teenager there are a few times when i felt i just can't do this anymore mm -hmm. um and so i really struggled with that um but um i did have faith as well yeah. have faith which also helped i think, I, I think absolutely that's what made me from doing silly things yeah Absolutely, because I think that's one of the things, you know, we're going to talk about momentarily, you know, about support networks, about support groups. But one of the things that, that seems to be a common thread with any form of, of mental, I don't want to call it illness, but with, with condition, let, let's call it that, um, you know, is that we, we get these thoughts in, in our minds and you can really end up verging off the deep end, particularly if people don't have support and things. What kind of family support or support from your friends did you have at that time? Um, I had quite a good, I had a few friends. I didn't have a great big, mm -hmm. big crowd of friends. Um, but there was a few friends that really helped me at school and supported me at school. Um, one guy, Richard, who I'm still friends with today, um, lives down south now again, but <laughs> you know, me and him helped each other. He, he used to like sort of protect me a lot yes. and you know, from a lot of it all. Um, so he used to take a lot of the flack for me. Um, and <laughs> He he was he is a really good friend, and you know, it's great when you have people like that to help and support you. Mum, my mum and dad helped me quite a bit as well. Um, you know, they were patient with me, and they really tried to, to help me and develop me, and they even gave me um, you know, tuition. They paid for tuition for a little while when I was at secondary school to help me to come along a bit and stuff. Well, that's what I was going to ask you because some of the the forms of therapy now that are out there, you know, is is uh, you know language therapy. If you struggle with speech, there is physiotherapy as well. Was there anything like that for you going through this as a, as a youngster um, around that time that you were able to tap into? Um, the main thing that because I have a problem with my kneecaps, okay. I have to do therapy. Um, um, basically, that was the only form of any support. School got me uh special pencil grips mm -hmm. um that wasn't until like middle yeah sec middle school um and that uh, up until that point i didn't used to hold my um pen or pencil correctly a lot of people will hold a pencil pen and pencil normal grip yeah when i used to write i i now hold a pen properly but i used to write like that with a grip right. like that and write okay so um you know that was you know little things like that helped a lot mm -hmm. um and then it was just perseverance really but at school i try to avoid a lot of stuff yeah, yeah right things um I, I, I and, and my handwriting is dreadful even yeah now. well i mean that, that's one of the things you know because I, I like you i was always you know made fun of because my handwriting it was you know and i never looking back now i don't understand this phrase when they say it, my handwriting looked like a spider ran across my page 
you know, only with Spider with roller skates on or muddy footprints or something like that. But I was like, even with dis with a dyspraxic mind, I was like, I can't make head and tail of that. Um, but it is, I mean, school, as we've said, is hard enough as it is when you've got dyspraxia or you've got another form of uh, mental condition that's there, um, it, it, it really affects how we process things. What was it like for you being in a classroom, you know, and, and you know, the, for, for both of us, I think they probably would have still used the chalkboard, you know, sort of right away on the chalkboard and you're struggling, you know, hard enough as it is because it's a black uh, chalkboard on white. We're going to talk about that, um, you know, but it was just you know you, you can you can make sense just about of what they've written because handwriting is not always the best as you see and then trying to get down the page is something really different what was it like on an average day for you going to school um and and trying to cope with all these things school um was quite a challenge in some ways because mm -hmm. as you're well aware school lots of information yeah. just um, yeah it's not dumped but you know a lot of information different subjects and you're trying to process it all throughout the day. Um, so by the time near the end of school, if it was English or maths, my brain was pretty much mush. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I just, like, even though I was meant to be writing things down, I just, it was like a mental blockage. Mm -hmm. I, I really struggled, um, especially if we were just left to do classwork. Yeah. Um, I would kind of struggle with that and sometimes I would just sit there and look like I was writing when I wasn't <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah it was it was quite hard going um, and then some days yeah with dyspraxia um, some days I feel really great and I can do lots of stuff yeah other days I feel rubbish and mm -hmm. feel really tired so even as a teenager you know what your teen your typical teenager is like you feel like oh, I just can't yeah. bother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like typical Harry Enfield kids. Yeah, yeah. Harry Enfield on YouTube. Um, and yeah, um, oh, it's gone from my head. Perry. One of oh yes, Kevin and Perry. Yes, Kevin and Perry. Look up Kevin and Perry on YouTube. <laughs> um, and so it's quite funny like that. Um, and you feel really tired. And then if you think about it, your teenage hormones yeah. and your angst and everything else, double on that. Mm -hmm. Some days. I would just like feel like I don't want to be at school at all. Yeah. I just want to be at home and just do absolutely nothing. It, it's an interesting thing because, you know, again, and, and I wasn't diagnosed actually until Graham and I were in college together. Uh, so I would have been, what, 21, 22. Mm. Um, you know, and, and it's, it is one of the things, and we're going to talk about, you know, later on, the, uh, the, the importance of trying to get it diagnosed early. And we'll, we'll, we'll go into all that later on. Um, but, you know, I certainly found growing up as a teenager, I was really tired. I processed things seemingly different. I absorbed the world differently. Um, and, you know, every single dyspraxia person is going to find things very, very different. You know, what, what Graham struggle with is different to what I struggle with. What I struggle with is different to what you may struggle with. Um, and, and some of the things that Graham is talking about, you know, is, is being in school and, you know, having to absorb so much information all at once, which sometimes a really, really difficult thing, and then trying to retain it. And then particularly in the 80s and the 90s, when we have this, you know, you're expected then to be able to, you know, recite your times tables, know all about your maths and, and do this, that, and the other. And I was, I was, I, I've got to choose my words very, very carefully, but I was basically put down a lot of the times and really discouraged by, uh, by family members without naming anyone because I really struggle with certain times tables, like seven, eight, I really struggle with, and sometimes with sixes. You know, anything, you know, above or below, I was fine with, but particularly with certain numbers, you know, I could have a real blind spot with them. Um, walk us through a little bit, because obviously you, you finish up school and everything. How, in fact, going up to exams, how was that for you from that point, from that, I'm laughing because you guys can't see this, but I can see that Graham's laughing about this question. How is it for you going into an exam situation in your school life? Um, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just lost it. Um, yeah, school was very interesting exams. You know, we were told a lot of stuff. Um, you know, different revision techniques and all, and all that different yeah. stuff. Even in the 90s, that was 
drilled into us because yeah. I took all GCSEs in 1996. Okay. Um, We're not actually that far apart, you and I. <laughs> no. I took my GCSEs in 96. Um, basically, revision was interesting because I'd try and read or do, do bits, but I just never, I retained some of it, yeah. but not enough to get high enough marks from my GCSEs. Right. So um, when I left school, yeah, it was mainly Ds, Es and Fs. Mm -hmm. Do you, your son or daughter, struggle with direction, clarity and purpose? Maybe you struggle with anxiety. Maybe you struggle with self-esteem or confidence issues. Maybe you've got great ideas, but you've no idea how to get from where you are to where you want to be. Don't worry, you're not alone. People around the world struggle with these issues. Hi there, I'm John Morris. I'm the coach to the creative mind and I'm also a psychologist in training. For the last two decades, I've worked with people from all walks of life and all over the world, all with a wide variety of issues. I've worked with people from youth groups to adult education to people dealing with day-to-day -day living issues. And each one of them has an amazing story to tell and we've helped them get clear as to where they are and clear as to where they want to be. And I want to help you too. Unlike a lot of life coaches and therapists that like to drag things on and leave you dangling on the carrot, I want to make sure that each and every single time that we meet and have a life coaching session together, that you never ever leave saying, man, that was a waste of time, or I didn't get the value that I desired. I am committed to making sure that each and every single time we meet, you are one step closer by the time we finish to a goal that you have in mind. So why should you work with me? Well, let me tell you, as I said, I'm committed to making sure that I provide value, that I provide something that's step-by-step -step and easy to follow. I'm also a fantastic listener. I've been blessed with the gift of listening, and I love to listen to people, their stories, their, their dreams, their desires, because there's nothing more energetic and passionate to me than when a client gets their first desire, or they get that goal, or they hit that big target, or whatever it might be. And also, as the trifecta, I am committed to you, to helping you take action. So whether or not it be deciding on the university you want to go to, deciding on the course that you want to be at, helping you get excited and passionate about your work environment, whatever it might be, I am committed to helping that happen. I'm also committed, if you need to shed some pounds, if you need to gain some muscle mass, if you need to, I don't know, develop your self-esteem, I'm committed to helping you take action and following a step-by-step plan of action that we can put together. But now folks, I want to tell you about the Early Bird Special Offer that we are launching right now. It is for 10 people and 10 people alone. That's right, if you are interested in having life coaching sessions with me one-on-one, -on -one, 10 people have the opportunity to do that and we're looking to help these people change their lives completely. We take ages 14 and upwards, so if you're interested in learning how to get from where you are to where you want to be, to really develop that passion to live a life that you enjoy as opposed to a life that you wake up and think, ah, you know, how to develop and change your mindset from maybe a negative one to a positive one, understanding what fuels your mindset and understanding what creates the kind of life that you want to live, then get in touch with me today. I would love to hear from you. As I say, this is open only for 10 people and once it's done, it's done. So click that box below, get in touch, let's have a conversation backwards and forwards and see if we're a fit for each other and I look forward to working with you. Have an amazing day. Hey folks, take care, God bless, and I will see you soon. Um, so what you would class as low grade passes. Yeah, yeah. And, and, um, and you're not alone in that because, you know, my secondary school, uh, for whatever dumb reason that they did, they, for, for maths, for example, they basically lumped, you know, all of us into certain classrooms. So you had one to six, uh, which is a very different grading system, obviously, to, to probably the rest of the world. Um, but the weird thing is for class five and class six, we were actually given a limit that you could not attain your standard grade. No matter how hard you tried, you could not attain a C level or above, um, which, you know, I had worked and worked really, really hard, you know, and I was telling my wife about this a couple of weeks ago um, in preparation for, for shows and things. And, you know, worked really hard. The teacher had promised me, you know, oh, we're going to move you up so you'll be able to get your standard grade and things. And it never happened. And when it never happened and I'd been promised and promised and promised, put in all the work and it didn't happen, I basically just gave up at that point on, on maths in particular. And I was like, well, if it's a DOS class, then I'm going to treat it like a DOS class. Um, and, you know, like yourself, I think I only came out with one um, set of, of, you know, standard grades, which enabled me then to go on to, to further education. Uh, and that was in computing for a new course that came around. Um, 
but it's really, really difficult. So talk to us a little bit, you, you leave school, what's next for you at that point? Um, I left school at 16 and in the English system, you either have, you go on to like apprenticeships yeah. or um, if your school has a sixth form college, you go sixth form, you go on to that. Um, I went to an independent sixth form college okay. in Totten and I wasted two years. <laughs> to be honest, I wasted two years. I was on a GMVQ intermediate um, leisure and tourism. Um, I've still not completed that. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's say, yeah, I've not completed that. Um, out of college, I'd done computer studies, GCSE, okay. and I got a C grade. And out of all my GCSEs, that's my only pass. It's, but hey, you know, I think now people are looking at it more and more because I actually went back, I, I did the same thing as you, I went to uh, Huddersfield Technical College, which is now known, I think, as Kirklees Centre or whatever it is now in Huddersfield. I went back to study uh, my business, I got a diploma, it took me two years to do it for a one year course, I actually had to redo a lot of it because I couldn't get in my brain uh, and it was a, there was a specific piece of coursework that, that you know, we had to do I can't remember the name of it, but I do remember vividly, um, you know, that throughout the year you're doing coursework and, you know, everybody else's coursework at the end of the year was like maybe 30 or 40 pages. Mine was 216. Uh, and I had to, and it was literally because I'd copied and pasted and repeated because I'd heard the teacher say, you know, oh, well, you can use stuff from your previous coursework and you can just, you know, copy and paste it and just change it and do whatever. And it confused the heck out of me. I went back the second year did it the way that I knew I needed to do it and it made the world of sense. So sometimes you've really got to trust your own, you know, instincts and own judgment on these things. I think the second time around it ended up being like 36 pages. So, you know, massively cut down from the year before. Um, so obviously you, you uh, go and study, you go in then I'm assuming into the workplace. Now the, the workplace for, for a lot of people right now is I think one of the hardest things because there is nothing that prepares you from leaving school, if you're in, in England, or leaving college or university, and then going into the workplace. That's where you're, you know, all these years of study come into play, and then you're going into the workplace. I know I found it really, really difficult. Um, yeah, that's a whole other topic for a whole other time. What was it like for you, Graham, going into to college, or going into the workplace? Um, basically, I'll start when I was 16, I've managed to get myself a Saturday job. Okay. Uh, in Debenhams, um, in the restaurant. Um, that was fun because <laughs> I used to clear tables a lot. Right. And as you can imagine, sometimes there are a few accidents. Yeah. Um, I'd done that. I, when I left college, um, it was sort of August. Yeah, sort of, I'd done a summer. And then basically, because um, Christmas is coming up, I didn't have another job. I said, oh, can I have a few more hours? So they're quite happy to give me more hours. And then it was sort of kind of February 99, well, just before Christ that Christmas, I signed up to be to go for agency work. Okay. Um, so I dotted my CV, whatever that was, um, yeah, to different places, different agencies. Um, uh, what, my, what was my big break was really my dad. Uh, okay. He worked for ESSO down at Forley. Um, um, uh, down at Forley, there's a great big oil refinery. Right. Um, just so people know the context. Um, and my dad worked in accounts payable, so he used to pay like the different invoices and things like that. What they were looking for was an admin assistant. Okay. Um, to do like data some data processing, yeah. filing, um, so, you know, just keeping all the filing up to date and everything like that, doing the mail. Um, that was a hard job. Uh, <laughs> that's I'll tell you a story in a bit. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it was it was things like that. Um, and that's like how I started in work. Um, and that was a bit, you know, quite a big learning curve because yeah. you have to stay focused. You have to sort of plan your day. And I'm not very good at planning. Mm. I will admit that. Um, I have to write, if I've got things to do or things coming up, I have to like put it in a diary, yeah. set reminders, and actually plan my time out on how I'm actually going to do each thing. Um, so, but in SA, I was just agency, I was left to do whatever I was left to do. Mm -hmm. So 
yeah, yeah, that's what happened. Mel, you know, you know the like uh, the, the, the things to open the mail with. Yes. Right. I had one of them. All right. So, a letter opener. Letter opener. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was, you know, doing that, and a few times I'd accidentally going a little bit too deep. All right. So tear up my important documents and things <laughs> like that. So I had to get the cell tape out and send oh, them back again. <laughs> And and that that was a quite a struggle because mm. sometimes um, I couldn't necessarily get the envelope open, right? With because of like manual dexterity, you know, dexterity and yeah. things and things like that. And afterwards, my hands used to ache quite a bit mm -hmm. just from doing that. Um, it was quite a challenge. And sometimes, yeah, you know, if it if it was like the been like a holiday period and the, the post had been delayed and things. Yeah. That like we'd have like big lots of mail come in, mm. and let's say that used to take like a whole morning just to sort out sometimes because yeah. there was so much. And what I find with my dyspraxia, I'm not the fastest mm -hmm. person in the world, um, which annoys a few people. Oh, excuse me. So um, yeah, I'm not necessarily the fastest person, and you know they used to get a bit frustrated. <laughs> it <laughs> is. Work and stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's it's understandable because my first job was, you know, very similar, I think, in a lot of ways to yours. I went to work for a, a heating, electrical and plumbing uh, business and originally I was brought in to do marketing, um, you know, and, and marketing folks is very, very simple. Basically, it's a case of saying the same thing over and over and over and over again until you get the designed uh, effect or, or sale or, or result that you want. Um, so for that, I'm really good at that because I can repeat the same things over and over and over again. But they decided the boss, in his insane wisdom, the witless wonder that he is, you know, basically decided, oh, I know, uh, I'm, I'm kind of getting bored with John being on, on marketing. How about we put him outside to do electrical work? I'm not trained as an electrician. He then decided, oh, I know, why don't we put him in building work? I'm not trained as a builder. I picked up a lot of skills. But then when people are coming back that are in the management system and saying, uh, well, this isn't done right and that isn't done right, uh, I'm not trained in doing this. I do not know anything about building or electricals or, or whatever. But it actually got to the stage for me, um, and, and this is just to, to kind of further on, I suppose, a little bit of the effects of, of dyspraxia, because it got to a stage for me where I actually had my first severe uh, nervous breakdown as a result of my first job because there was so much pressure that was there that I was feeling it's my first job I was maybe 17 years old um you know you, you're coping with dyspraxia and all you can hear every single day is oh you've not done this right you've not done that right you're a dot 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 moron idiot fool whatever it might be and again these are things these are you know these are commonplace words in the workplace in the the early 2000s and and in the 90s and things you know, it, it wasn't something that was out of character when it was reported. It was a case of, no, I don't believe that at all. And the boss is just dismissing it and everything. But, you know, for me, I was like, I can't cope with this. This has just drove me insane. And uh, it, like Graham was saying, if you're not the fastest, if you're not this, if you're not that. I actually got in trouble, folks, just before we move on. I got in trouble for doing exactly what my manager had told me to do. And he said, oh, well, you need to use some forethought and some, some of your own thinking as well. And I'm like, well, I've tried that before. And all they ever did was get me into trouble. So I decided if I do exactly what you tell me to do, you know, you can't say anything to me. Um, so Graham's talking about, you know, the, the, the fact that, you know, work was really, really difficult and work was really slow. What were some of the, the, the biggest struggles and the bigger challenges in your journey with dyspraxia in the working environment? Whew. Um, I ask the big questions. I seem to always do this with every guest. Yes, yes, yeah, I've asked the big question. <laughs> um, workplace, sometimes, uh, you know, I had to organise things to be moved from one place to go into, like, storage. Okay. And so a lot of the time, for me, I had to make phone calls. Right. Um, and being in, a, you know, sort of my late teens and things, I struggled making phone calls. Mm -hmm. Um, I still do not make like making phone calls. I refuse. Unless I absolutely have to, I refuse to, to call people. Um, and so, and as I've got older, I've got a lot better mm -hmm. as my confidence has grown. But sometimes I, I still really struggle with it. Yeah. And I get really nervous 
am anxious just trying to call someone sometimes, um, especially for the first time. Yeah. Because you know, I don't know who they are. I don't yeah. know what like yeah, you know, what they're gonna ask me and things like that. And it, it, it's just like that. But yeah, you know, like the pit of your stomach just mm-hmm. like turns over and just flip flops and. Yeah, you know what I'm trying to describe. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, again, it's something that I, I totally understand. We overthink things in a lot of ways, yeah. as opposed to for, for your ordinary person that can pick up a phone and ring somebody, hey, how are you doing? For us, it takes a lot of thought. And, and you know, for me, my wife, Katie, will do a lot of phone calls because, you know, it depends very much on my mood, I'll be honest, as to, you know, how I respond to this situation. Sometimes, you know, making a simple thing such as a phone call and talking to somebody in the outside world is is too much, mm. believe it or not, for, for a lot of people that suffer with dyspraxia. Um, were there ever times that you ended up, you know, in front of the, the manager's office where they said, Graham, you've not done this right. Graham, you've not done that right. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Talk, talk to us a little bit about that and what that was um, like for you. There's There's been a few times, probably early on when I first started at um, SO, um, there was a couple of times I'd done a few things wrong that I shouldn't have done. Right. Um, and thankfully, my boss, she was like really nice. That's good. Um, and she really kind of helped me out a bit. And so uh, that was quite an interesting one. But thing on um, when my when later on when I went on to different jobs, um, let's say I was called all sorts for mucking things up. Yeah. Um, which I will not repeat because you've got kids. <laughs> but I was called everything under the sun. Yeah. But I mean, um, you know, for just talking about that, what did that do f- to you from a self-esteem point of view? Self-esteem point of view, not very good. Yeah. Um, I eventually went into construction industry. Right. Um, and so that place, yeah, that kind of workplace is a lot of swearing. Um, and basically, you know, if I... I was in wages, doing wages. So if I mucked up a guy's wages, mm-hmm. they, they would get paid weekly. Yeah. So if I mucked up that guy's wages and I mucked up his overtime, you know, I would, the next following week he'd be in my office saying, Graham, mm-hmm. what the yeah have you done? Yeah. Wrong. And why haven't you done this? Or why haven't you done that? And sometimes, you know, it is quite bad, um, what people have said have called me. Oh yeah. Um once um we had a lot of agency workers um a lot of people from poland um and other eastern european countries mm-hmm. uh and so it was quite interesting once i got mucked up a guy's thing he came in he could speak english and let's say he said if you don't do this right your neck will be yeah yeah um let's say i quickly reported it <laughs> <laughs> but i have to say that was the most threatened I've ever felt and felt like I was really and that did not that did not help my confidence at all no I, um, I can imagine it, it's you know and, and the thing about it is you know yes fair enough now we know a lot more but when you're going through these things and you are constantly walking on eggshells because like Graham's saying he's dealing with wages people do some funny things when money's involved um and you know he's seen it I've seen it um, and it doesn't even need to be a lot of money, but people do some really crazy yeah. things when money's involved. Um, you know, and, and like he's saying, you know, you're constantly having that fear and anxiety of, is mm. somebody going to come and say something to me today? That was what resulted for me in my first nervous breakdown. Um, how, in fact, Graham, did it, did it get to a stage for you with the, that particular job where you were just like, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to do this. Yeah, yeah. Um... I stopped when I worked for this this company. I um, started off at agency, mm-hmm. and then they made me a permanent employee, which was really good. And I worked. My contract was forty five hours a week. Right. Wow. Um, and that was quite a big demand because you're in that like half seven and you finished at five. Yeah. Um, and that was a long long day. Mm-hmm. Um, so and that was quite quite hard going, and we just kept on. And then I think I was about three, four years in that I just didn't like it, but I couldn't be bothered to yeah. look for another job. Yeah. Um, it was part of that whole thing of I'm comfortable here. It's paying yes. the way, you know. And I think a lot of people fall into that rut of, well, I'm here. It's paying my, paying my bills, paying my house, paying whatever it might be, um, you know, and 
that sometimes can really just, you know, be a stumbling block, I think, for a lot of people. They get comfortable, uh, even in situations that they really don't like. Yeah. Um, but obviously, your life did change and things moved on and things happened. Um, what year was it that you left uh, working for there? Um, I finished working for that company in 2009. Okay. Um, and that point, I moved up to Scotland mm -hmm. on a mad quest. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, talk to us a little bit about that because it, it, you know, your journey does take an incredible yeah. um, change in things. Talk, talk to us a little bit yes. about that. Um, I, as I've said previously, I've spoken about faith. Mm -hmm. um, um, and if that's okay, John, I'll yeah, yeah, absolutely, that. absolutely, go for it. Just, just wanted to double check before I dived in. We're mind, body, and soul, so we're going to examine everything today. Yeah. Let's go for it. Absolutely. Um, basically, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. I became a Christian at nine years old. Um, and then, yeah, I sort of got involved with the church as I got older, got into youth work. John done all that stuff as well. Um, John got paid for it. I never did. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I was doing youth work um, for the church and everything like that. And that was all good laugh. Done camps as well. I was like um, manager of one of the camps. You know, I don't know what on earth they thought about that. Because <laughs> my organisation skills is like, woo! Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it all panned out. Um, so in, like, I felt for a while that I was, felt I was called into some form of ministry um, by God. So I, in 2009, I started to look into things and I thought I needed some form of training. Um, so I looked um, online. Um, my wife thought I was a nutter because I used to shout around the house going dingwall for no apparent reason. And I'll go into that more. Um, and yeah, she thought I was a bit, a bit crazy. Um, and I looked at different courses and this course in Dingwall, it was a access course, access to theology. And basically you didn't have to have any qualifications. Mm -hmm. They were willing to take you on. You could either do it um, online or you could go to like proper classes. Um, for me, I wanted to do proper classes. I thought if I was going to take this seriously and yeah. do like the work and study, I had to be in the classes and actually do things like that. And it was a big bold step mm -hmm. because we have a house in England. Uh, we bought a house in 2007. Uh, John knows my story, so this is quite <laughs> funny for him. Uh, so I bought, yeah, we bought this house in 2007, and then within two years, I said we're moving up to Scotland. <laughs> um, as we know, the financial markets weren't great. Yeah. Um, so we put the house up for sale in 2009. Oh, excuse me, <coughs> 2009. And what happened after that took us nearly five years to sell the house. Um, in that time, we had to rent it out and things because we couldn't afford the mortgage. Yeah. The mortgage was silly money. So, Ab absolutely. And and again, you know, like you were saying, you know, how faith had changed it. Because I remember that journey and it seemed like it took forever for this house to sell. Um, yeah. You know, uh, you know, and, and as, as we go through things, um, you know, on, on my journey to kind of just link the, the two, I moved up to Scotland from England in 2010. I moved up here to do youth work, um, of which uh, I actually, by the time I finished up, was about 15 years worth in youth work, which was uh, interesting to say the least. Um, and uh, I believe Katie and I have, have got an interview about that. So if you want to go check that out, please do feel free. Um, but, you know, it, it was a really interesting journey. And a lot of people around me at the time were saying, you know, if you really do feel called to this, exactly what Graham said, you do need some form of training. Basically, if, if you want to work in the church, you know, you got to do it on our terms. Um, you know, Graham's journey progresses from Dingwall. Uh, I, but was it the Scottish Baptist College next that you went to? Yes, I went to Highland Theological College, done yes. my year there. Mm -hmm. um, also, it was like a test of water to see whether I could study. Yeah. Um, let's say... I done very well on that on that very on that course, no, that's um, and you know and that managed to get me onto uh, the degree to make to get myself onto yeah. the degree course. Um, I could have stayed up at HTC, but that meant really me kind of staying up there or moving down to the Baptist College um, in Paisley, and we're under the banner of UWS University yeah. of West of Scotland. Um, 
So, and I started that in 2010 with you, John. Um, <laughs> and we were a lot younger and a lot slimmer. <laughs> um, and basically, we just connected kind of straight away, didn't we? Yeah, I, I think on, quite on literally. Because, and, and my journey was, was very, very simple. Um, again, something that doesn't really happen. Jim Gordon was our uh, principal at the time, since retired now. And literally, I went in there for an interview with him, sat down, chatted, and he said, well, on the basis of this, you know, I'm, I'm willing to give you a, you know, a place in it. And I'm like, wow, you guys must have been really desperate, you know, to, to just give, give, give places out like that. Um, but it was, I mean, Graham and I uh, literally just, you know, kind of gravitated to each other and we, you know, we, we just hit it off. Um, I think, you know, for, there was other people that we hit off with. There was certainly other people I did not hit it off with. Because uh, for whatever reason, I had a bit of a reputation. Um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> it was it was interesting. But it was also interesting because Graham ha had been diagnosed with dyspraxia. I hadn't, didn't even know I had it. I just, I, I was thinking, you know, well, this is what I've got. You know, this is just the way I am. Um, and obviously it was through our journey together that we, we kind of was able to share a little bit with each other. And when I was diagnosed with dyspraxia, Graham was one of the first people that I actually approached. And he said, oh, yeah, I've got that as well. And, and from there, it was, you know, we began to, to talk about it as well. Um, how did you find college life, actually, um, obviously coping with dyspraxia? Hard. Oh, oh <laughs> it, 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 I find it very hard. Um, there, you know, when I first went there, I was like really nervous, anxious. Um, and I remember like, yeah, the first week and when we got all the assignments, mm. I came home to Laura and I was like, how am I going to do this? How am I honestly going to do yeah. this? Cause I saw these dates and I was like panicked. Um, thankfully, Laura, my wife's a teacher. Mm -hmm. So she sat me down and done like a whole plan for me. Um, so I could actually see it. Yeah, it wasn't as bad as it actually was. So, and she really helped me out just working it all out and plan it all out. And with that plan, I it worked for me. Um, you know, I managed to study and I managed to, you know, get all my course, all my work in that had to, had to be in at the time. Um, classes, you know, unless I had to do, you know, like a presentation, yeah. I was very quiet. Um, <laughs> because, and John was the exact opposite. Yeah. John was the exact opposite. <laughs> You, you never guess that, would you? <laughs> <laughs> um, and what I found was my brain couldn't necessarily keep up with all the discussion. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm more of a deep way I feel it. Think it is I'm a more of a deep thinker. I like to ponder things and time things. I actually come up with things. The conversations moved on. Yeah, completely. And so it is like oh, and you know. <laughs> And I was one of the quiet, that's how I was like really quiet in class. I think I must have frustrated a few of the lecturers. <laughs> at times. And sometimes I think Jim Gordon said to me um, at one point, um, you know, some days Graham, you bring your A game and you're really good. And other days you're just like, there's nothing there, is there? <laughs> okay, yep. <laughs> and I think in one lecture or one sort of class we had Stuart, one of our lecturers, um, was basically going to finish up early and he says i could tell graham you were just done in <laughs> <laughs> and it was just like kind of phrase like that i'm not sure if you're in whether you're with us at that point but um yeah and some of those lectures were hard going i mean uh ian birch as much as i love him to talk to he is the only lecturer that i have legitimately fallen asleep through his uh lecture because ian as i said lovely guy i have yep. nothing but love for him but he's got a very soothing voice I think would be a nice way to put it where Stuart wasn't Stuart was more like myself really intense and, and Stuart and I got on very very well um but whereas Graham like you're saying you know he was more of a deep thinker because of the way dyspraxia affects me I absorb everything really quickly which is what tires me out um and it's every single detail that's there but then you know he could ask me a question directly and I'm, I'm thinking of one instance in particular where Stuart said to me Oh, John, because and for whatever reason, he picked on me this day and he said, John, what did you think about this book? I thought it'd be right up your street. And I said, I absolutely hated it. I flung it across the room and I want to burn it. And that was literally what came out of my mouth. And Stuart's face just, oh, my goodness, I cannot believe you just said that. And I was like, well, I'm being honest. You know, no one else 
<laughs> a lot of other people in the room don't seem to be, but that was my general feeling. Um, but it was, I mean, unfortunately, because of, of my issues with colitis, I was taken to hospital. I ended up having to leave in 2012. Graham continued on. And Graham, what I wanted to ask you was, and, and I've wanted to ask you this probably for years now, what was it like for you when you get to the, 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 the fourth year? Because for, for whatever reason, it seemed that third year seemed to be the really heavy one where everybody's workload increased. By fourth year, you've adapted to it a little bit more, but what was it like for you when you know, hey, I'm coming to the end of my course, and this is the big thing that's going on here. Right. Um, I'll give people a bit of context to this as well. In 2012, 13, in my third year, um, yeah, my wife was pregnant with my oldest daughter, Phoebe. Mm -hmm. um, pregnancy went through really well. At the beginning of the third year, I had whooping cough. So for a lot of my, my third, like after, even though I recovered, my energy levels were constantly yeah. really low and I actually found it really hard for year. I know everyone did, but I think I found it yeah. really, really hard. Um, managed to get through for year. don't know how I managed to do that. Um, my daughter was born in March of 2013 um, and she has got all different mm -hmm. issues which John knows about. Um, and, you know, I was basically, we were still living with my, in, my in-laws at the time as well. So it was all kind of new, kind of hard going. I've completed my third year and then I went into fourth year. Um, and I done fourth year um, full time. Mm -hmm. um, my mother-in-law would look after Phoebe during the time, during the days I'd have to be in college. Excuse me. Um, during college. And basically, but when I wasn't in college, um, Laura was working. And so I was having to look after Phoebe and trying to study. Yeah, I mean, that that's a heavy load, I think, for anybody. Uh, and, and honestly, I mean, that was one of the things we said when lockdown happened, because our businesses were both really, really busy and everything. And we both, and I know I said it to you as well, Graham. Yeah, I literally am so thankful that right now we do not have small little kids. I do not know how people, because I know my temperament. Um, and I wasn't well at the time. I told my midsection, all sorts of other weird stuff. So I'm just really glad at that point that we didn't have something else to think about. I can't imagine what that was like for you, obviously, having to study for uh, a, a BD, I believe it was. And, um, you know, obviously having a, a family, a young family as well to cope with. I mean, that's that's a lot. Um, walk us through a little bit coming up towards the end of your time um, at college. You've made a decision that, hey, I want to pursue this further. I want to go into the board of ministry. Walk us through this whole process and this whole thing that kind of unravels in the, uh, as the story uh, progresses. You want me to talk about the board of ministry? Or... You can do, go for it, yeah. Um, well, I went to the board of ministry in 2013 in my third year of college. Um, as I said, I had whooping cough mm -hmm. and I was on placement when I went to the board of ministry. So I was like deadbeat. Yeah. I was really deadbeat. Um, and at this board, you do different segments, different things to see how suitable you'll be for ministry. Um, my brain and everything was just like, I was okay for at the start of the day, I had to give like my testimony, you know, describe my life and how I've come to this point. Um, and then it was basically, you know, throughout the day. And by the time, you know, the afternoon came, I was starting to really, really okay. flag. Um, and that you know trying to speak and trying to answer questions i was like doing delay tactics yeah to get like my formulation and things like that um and so it's quite interesting and because i couldn't get my views across properly um i couldn't express myself properly i you know they kind of unfortunately said i wasn't acceptable yeah. for the board um which is fair enough, and you know I can understand that. And looking at hindsight, I can understand that as well. Um, and but you know I was never great. I'm never great at interview situations. I will be honest. Um, You're fantastic today. I mean, well, it's more relaxed in this way. So <laughs> well, it's more relaxed, and, I, and it's not a job. I'm not going for a job or something that could affect my future. Yeah. Um, which you know it. It, it plays on your mind going in these things. It really does play on your mind. And if you're tired, run down, um, try to keep everything else together, 
you're kind of thinking, how am I going to do it? <laughs> yeah, yeah do definitely. It. Um, so, and they said no in 2013. Mm-hmm. And I could go back at some point. I'll clarify now, I've never gone back. Yeah. Um, with different reasons, and I'm sure me and John will discuss it a little bit further in a little while. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And so I just got on and just done, you know, my coursework and stuff at uni. And I think a lot of people kind of thought I'd drop out at that point. Mm-hmm. But I didn't. I thought, I'd, yeah, I've started this now. Yeah. I'll carry on for this my degree and get my degree, um, yeah. which I've done in 2014. Absolutely. And I think it's, it is a fantastic thing because, you know, I, I mean, I can imagine, you know, it being so disheartening at the time. And it was obviously, you know, we, we spoke about it a, a lot um, and probably ranted about it a lot as well. But, you know, it, it's like, why would they let you go all this time and then say no? But like you said there and, and like you described, you know, looking back in hindsight, it, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing because sometimes mm. it can be the best thing for us. Um not to be involved in a particular system that you know years down the line may not have been you know uh, beneficial to this, if, if that makes sense um obviously you know your, your time finishes at university at college um and um you know you graduate and everything what was kind of the next step for you next step for me was a um, full-time parent <laughs> <laughs> um full-time parent and i've been doing that you know since 2014 um, on a full-time basis, looking after my, both my kids now, yeah. um, and all the different things I have to deal with that because both my kids have got uh, medical conditions, yeah. so we have a lot of NHS appointments, mm-hmm. um, a lot of medical appointments, so and a lot of prescription things I have to sort of keep an eye on prescriptions, yeah. how much we've got, and stuff like that. Um, basically, my wife kind of phrased it as like. Um, you know, prescriptions manager, <laughs> you know, trying to keep track of everything and yeah. keep it all going and keep the stocks in for what, uh, you know, for Phoebe and for Reuben and stuff. And it's just like crazy. Yeah. I mean, it is incredible again with dyspraxia and everything that we've unpacked so far, you know, that you're able to do that. And again, you keep it on top of it. And I do think and honestly believe that when, you know, we, we've got something else to kind of keep our focus, that that really helps. Because, you know, when it's just us, it's like, okay, you're focused on us. But, you know, if it's a child, in some cases, it's a life or death thing. Um, I want to talk to you, again, from your own uh, experience and your own background, some of the misconceptions. um, There is definitely one that I want to pick on uh, with dyspraxia. uh, And it's the whole thing that it only affects children. Obviously, you and I, as we've talked about today, you know, it doesn't only affect children. It isn't something you can just, you know, grow out of. Sometimes the effects lessen, sometimes they get worse, sometimes other effects start to uh, present themselves. Um, what were some of the misconceptions with dyspraxia that you had uh, both kind of gone through and that was was laid on to you? Um, very much early on that I'd grow out of my tripping and things like that. I'd grow out of it. Um, I never have. <laughs> <coughs> Um, yeah, things like that, you know, miss, you know, and people like sort of think, oh, he'll get better as he gets older. Yeah. Anything, some things have lessened a little bit, other things have come to the forefront. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, every day is a challenge Yeah. on my part. Um, I love, I'm sure you find that as well, every day is a bit of a challenge in some way. Yeah. Um, so, at Yesterday, we, my daughter and son had an occupational therapy appointment online, and they had to use um, the putty. Okay. And it's a like proper, I can't think what it's called now. Um, and basically, it's to help you with like your dexterity and things right, like that. Right, okay. And they, the occupational therapist wanted me to warm it up because it's really tough to right. start off with. And, you know, my dexterity is not the mm-hmm. best. Um so I actually even struggled to get it warmed yeah. up enough for the kids to try and apply it and use it. Um, so it's it is, and, and it is, you know, it, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. You know, sometimes just making that movement and that motion yeah. for folks with dyspraxia is a really difficult thing. Because remember, like I said, if you take our brain and rewire everything, that's basically yeah. where we're at. Some of the other misconceptions, um, and that there is one that I do want to, to touch on based with you, uh, but some of the other misconceptions that, that we've looked at when we've been studying, 
were, you know, things like, if, if I can't see it, it isn't there. And this is one of the most stupid ones. We spoke to a lady a couple of weeks ago about Tourette's. And again, it's the whole thing, if it can't be seen, you know, it, it can't be there and, and all the kind of things. Obviously, now we know that that isn't true. I also want to ask you as well, Graham, was there anyone else in your family that had a history of dyspraxia or were, were you the first? As far as I'm aware, I'm the first. Okay, okay. Um, there might be others in the past, but yeah. because it is supposed to be hereditary, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. Yeah. Um, so there might have been other people in my family, whether it's on my mum's side or on my dad's side, I don't know. Okay. So, and, and, you know, and, and that is one of the things, you know, again, like Graham was saying, you know, sometimes can be a misconception, sometimes can be absolutely accurate, you know, sometimes it's passed on, sometimes it's not. As far as I'm aware, you know, there's no one in my family that has dyspraxia. Um, but that's, again, you know, someone, no one's ever come forward and say, hey, I'm the cause for you having this. Um, now, we want to just throw some things out for, for parents in particular with kids, because I think this is really, really important to cover that, you know, certain things that are really going to make an impact on your child you know is things like making sure you get it diagnosed early because what that tends to do as graham has, has talked about in in today's show um it helps the child in particular uh have acceptance by their peers it also really helps their self-esteem when they're accepting it at a young age and able to say you know I, i've got this this is how it affects me but there's also so much more help that's there like i said i wasn't diagnosed until i was 21 I often have wondered, you know, if I was diagnosed when I was 12 or, or maybe five, you know, what difference that would have made. But equally, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. Um, other things as well that, you know, uh, are going to make a real, real difference. If you get it diagnosed early and early enough, it can make a massive difference between success and, and failure or making the path a little bit harder for somebody. Um, but don't, you know, don't doom and gloom if you have dyspraxia or you, or your child has dyspraxia because, you know, we're often, you know, some, in, in some ways, more creative minds. You know, I run obviously up my heart for 18 years. I'm now doing this. Graham's doing his own thing, you know, and, and we've got minds that operate in different ways, which is fantastic. Graham, I wanted to ask you just as we wrap up, you know, how does dyspraxia affect you now as, as, as you've gotten older with it? As I've gotten older with it? Um still coordination problems uh i still trip I, i've mentioned that in the, already yeah tripping up over things um sometimes um people can say things to me and my short-term memory is rubbish yeah it always has been quite rubbish but as i'm getting older uh -huh. i think it's kind of getting a little bit worse right so um i someone could say i'll oh, do this or could you do this and I can forget it within yeah. a matter of seconds. Mm -hmm. um, and I have listened to it. Don't get me wrong. I yeah. have listened. Yeah. But within a matter of seconds, within a minute, I could have forgotten it. But but that's um, something that seems to cause frustra frustration with other people as well. Because like this morning, and, and the reason that I smiled about this is because uh, Katie was busy getting ready for her meeting this morning. Um, and she asked me if I would make the porridge this morning. She gave me all the measurements and said, you need to have half water, half milk. Well, I went used whole milk and I couldn't remember the measurements. So I'm like, okay, let's do a guess thing. Yeah, it, it literally tasted like chewing husks. You know, it was really, really heavy, <laughs> really uncomfortable. I was like, oh boy. But, you know, but again, some people do get frustrated and they take it almost mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as an insult that, oh, well, they're just not listening to me. When it's not that we're not listening to you, it's just that what you've said, literally, mm -hmm. it's called goldfish syndrome you know, two or three seconds later, we have completely forgotten. And then what bits we can remember are usually incorrect. Um, yes. But the good no, thing is the, we're not alone with that. Sorry, go on, Graham. I was going to say, and also you could do things in the wrong order. Mm, yeah, yeah. Do things in the wrong order. Um, and then that just completely messes the whole thing up if it's meant to be really systematic. And yeah. you forgot what you're kind of doing and you do it in the wrong steps. So it's... Yeah, no, no, and, and it's true, you know, again, and that's how you end up with, you know, a coursework paper that's meant to be 36 pages and it ended up being 216, um, you know, but it, it's been so much fun. Graham, is there anything that you want to add to the show that we've not covered uh, at this point? Um, um, I was going to say, I kind of mentioned about my driving. Yeah, of course you can. Um, no, that's a big thing, actually. Go for it. That is, that is a really big thing. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you about my tale of driving. I have gone through eight tests. I worked this out the other day. Um, I've gone through eight driving tests. I've gone through seven manual, 
and one automatic. Okay. I try started driving when I yeah you know, seventeen because that's the thing you're meant to do. Mm-hmm. Um, went through four tests, failed all four. Um, I was a loon. Well, I wasn't safe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then someone when I was about twenty, someone suggested to me about um trying an automatic car instead because you don't have to think as yeah. don't have to go through as many processes. So I went through uh through that. I went done an automatic test. Um so I I've, I've done automatic test and I passed the first time. And for a lot of years I went through driving an automatic. When we moved up to Scotland I had to sell my automatic car. Um so for about four for a few years I didn't drive at all. And then when Phoebe was coming along, I uh, realised I had to go and drive, you know, learn to drive again. So I had to get myself back into a manual car. I could drive it, don't get me wrong, I could drive yeah. a manual, but it was just things, just sometimes things were a bit get on top of me. Yeah. Um, and I managed to pass my test um, in 2013 in a manual car. Um, took another three attempts. <laughs> Um, so, it, it, and, you know, and even now when I'm driving, um, you know, there are some times, you know, I'm meant to change gear, yeah. um, where some people without dyspraxia will just do it naturally. Mm-hmm. I, sometimes I'm still having to think about it mm-hmm. quite, you know, quite, um, quite a bit. So if I drive for a long time, I'm completely done. Yeah, and and I think it's I think it's I think it is a good point to to bring that up because for, and again you know it's an incredible thing what Graham has done to give you a, a comparison. I do not drive, um, and the reason I do not drive, like Graham, I went and I sat my test. Um, I I failed the first time and I failed on one silly thing, and it was because we're on a road. Still envision it, still tell you exactly where it was, and a guy who was in a van was zooming up behind me and, and literally forcing me to go faster. I'm trying to get out the guy's way. And, you know, went over the speed limit and then back down and, uh, you know, basically was failed on that. Um, and then the second time, you know, I, 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 I was developing, I think, a lot of issues at that point with dyspraxia, with other things, because there was a lot of stuff that was going on at the time. And um, I remember the day of my test, you know, really trying to will myself into this. My confidence was completely shocked because after I failed it the first time, I'm thinking, if I failed it the first time, it's probably not going to happen for me at this point. Um, went and, and did it, and uh, one of I, I think I had three, you know, quite big things. One, I cut a guy. I, I literally zoomed over into a lane, and the lady said, "Oh, he didn't check. He didn't check." And I'm like, "Yeah, probably didn't." To be fair, and it was actually I didn't need to make the maneuver. There was other things that went on, but by that point, I was so exhausted because the way that my driving instructor tended to do it was instead of just going and doing your driving test, he would give you a lesson before doing your driving test and the problem with that is for me by the time i've done an hour's driving i'm exhausted physically mentally at that point i couldn't do it plus i was having problems with my sight um and just a lot of zoning out things as a result of uh, misdiagnosis with medication all sorts of other things that were going on and my driving instructor actually took me um to the place where i failed where i made the first mistake and he was like why on earth did you you know cross you know cross over uh, lanes but then telling him the story as to what was going on, the fact that I was having problems with vision, concentration, so on, so on, so on. And he said, if that's the case, you should not be on the road and you should not be driving, which is true. Um, it may be something, you know, because the condition is, is lessened, but it may be something I explore again in the future. Although working from home, you know, at this point, I'm not needing to. Um, I may need to hire a chauffeur. Who knows? Um, but, uh, you know, all these things, folks, you know, dyspraxia affects each and every single one of us in a very, very different way. Mm. Um, and there is a ton of information out there. Graham, where can people go if they want to know more about dyspraxia? Um, if people want to find out more about dyspraxia, there's the Dyspraxia Foundation. Um, they are on Facebook. They are online. Um, you know, they've got a lot of social, yeah, and they're a charity mm-hmm. as well. Um, they're really good, and they'll give you lots of advice um, and things like that. Also, uh, there's a book called Caged in Chaos. Um, I can't remember the the person's name, the author's okay. name now, but um, and that's like she wrote that as a teenager, and I think she's since updated it. I've only ever read the teenage okay. version. 
Um, she's since updated it, and you know that's a really good book. Okay. Um, for like sort of young people, teenagers, um, who have been diagnosed, and I think they'll really click into it and stuff, and really sort of. And I think there's lots of, yeah, there's a few books out there now. So, mm -hmm. um, I've not read them all. But, um, <laughs> that's fantastic, and we'll definitely uh, check that one out. Check the author out, and we'll put the link in the uh, the link section, comment section, everything. Uh, below because you know we want to give you guys as much resource as possible so as you can really understand and make an educated decision for yourself regarding dyspraxia and get help um, don't just do sometimes what we have done and accept the doctor's diagnosis um, make sure that you do the research as well it's really important graham i want to thank you so much for being my special guest today it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to have you on the show it's been a delight it really really has we've had a lot of fun and really unpacked a lot of things but folks, we are out of time. But before we go, I want to tell you about a brand new book. In fact, it's my brand new book, and it's called The Battles That We All Face. It's available at battlesweallface.com. If you've got anxiety, if you're struggling with trauma, if you're struggling with depression and so much more that's going on, if you're looking for funny, quirky teachings, stories, life stories, and so much more, I definitely encourage you to check this book out. Plus, you get uh, exclusive views of my uh, brand new artwork as well. It's available in ebook and paperback. And there's even a signed copy available as well. And that's at thebattlesweallface.com. There'll be as an ad available on the end of the show and you can check that out. But again, I want to thank Graham so much for being on the show. It's been a pleasure. I'm sure we'll have him on at some point again because there's so much more still to unpack. He's been Graham Horn. I have been your host, John Morris. This has been the Mind, Body and Soul podcast where we help you find balance in the craziness of day-to-day -day life, providing inspirational, motivational and educational content and have a great day. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Tell a friend because you never know. It may just be the very thing that helps them massively. And uh, it also helps us when you like, share, and subscribe as well. Until next time, take care, God bless, and we'll catch you soon. When we come into this world, we come in with a sense of awe and wonder, believing that things will work out for the best, filled with excitement. We play like children and we enjoy our lives. But as we get older, we find out that everything maybe isn't as rosy as we first thought it would be. Live life long enough and you realize that what once seemed like happy families can very quick turn into Dungeons and Dragons. Have you ever experienced anxiety, worry, or maybe even fear on an insane level? I want to let you know right here, right now, that you're not alone. Everything from homelessness, betrayal by my best friend, abandonment from the people that I thought would have my back. In fact, I've experienced so many different situations. To tell you all would take a very, very long time indeed. But the good news is I'm here to tell you that, well, they've left their mark on me. I've come through all of them. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I've got a brand new book. It's called The Battles That We All Face. This book is designed to give you encouragement. It's designed to give you hope. It's designed to teach you, to challenge you, to get you to think a little bit more. The full title is The Battles We All Face, a devotional with a difference. Because I don't want you to just read it from start to finish. I want you to take time over this. I want you to read the first chapter and really process it. This book is designed, if nothing more, as I said, to challenge you, to encourage you, to give you hope, but ultimately to let you know that whatever you're facing, you, my friend, are not alone. I want to encourage you right now to not let fear or the past stop you from living an amazing, amazing life. Each page in this book has one of my art pieces in it and has been specifically placed there to give you, the reader, an association to the subject discussed. Please don't delay. You owe it to yourself to start rebuilding your life. Life is not over until you draw your last. Don't delay. Order today. Life is short. You owe it to yourself as long as you're drawing breath to stand up and fight for the things that you want in life. And my friend, you've got an ally in me who understands completely what you're going through. Have an awesome day. Click that link below and I'll see you on the other side.